Hey everybody, guess what? We're at the Shire Town. Don't know the Shire Town? The sign's right behind me. Very cool spot in Hampton, New Brunswick. And Russell DeCarl from, you guessed it, Prairie Oyster. I knew you knew it because everybody that watches this is a music fan. And Prairie Oyster, gold, platinum records, uh, so many awards. Juno's, Canadian Country Music Association awards, big time. The band is legendary. And Russell DeCarl is doing some great new music. You got to check it out, his awesome trio. And uh, we're going to go inside. We're going to talk to him and you're going to get to see some of the magic on stage. All right, follow me. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. All right, Russell DeCarl, he's here. He's here. Jeff, Jeff we're, we're, in, we're, we're, <laughs> we're in Hampton, and this is the new record, Russell DeCarl Trio, and uh, what is it? Something about a loud mouse. Loud mouse studios. <laughs> Not a loud mouth. A loud mouse studios. It's the new record. Check it out. And last time you were through, we'll put that down. Last time you were through, it was under a big blue sky, like today. Yes. Under big, big sky. That was yeah, the first right. Was, I guess probably 2011, wasn't it? I was through here. Was, yeah, it, would it, have been? Like that. was it that yeah. long ago? Yeah. yeah. It seems like time, just. Time flies. It really does. Yeah. And so, and with that record, what are the changes to you know what you did there and what you do now with the trio here? Well, I've been, I've been touring mostly. That, that record, of course, is uh, there's a lot of great players on that first record. It's a full band album, and uh, I wrote nine of the eleven songs, so it's mostly original material. <clears throat> Now, I went in the uh, studio last year before I made this record, and I cut half of another album that's actually in the can, as they say, uh, or as, 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 as us old gummers say, in the can. Because kids, you know, we used to record on tape, and of course the can was the canister. Anyway, sorry. Kick the can. Yeah, kick, yeah, yeah, you know, back when we were kicking the can, and kicking the can, and yeah, exactly, man. And uh, it's kind of a southern soul record, and it's, uh, wow. it's uh, a bunch of new original material. And it's all, again, with a full band, but with the trio, with Dennis and Steve and myself and a few other really great players. But I knew I wasn't going to get that uh, record done in time for uh, last summer's festival touring uh, schedule. So, and uh, after every show, one of the great things about doing this gig is that it's really kind of, it's, I get to tell my story, and that involves me uh, performing my own material as well as a lot of my favorite songs and some obscure tunes that I'm you know, emotionally connected to and that I like to do. And um, it's after every show, like I've been touring I guess, the last four years mostly with, with these two guys, with Dennis and Steve, Dennis Keldy and Steve Briggs. And um, after pretty much every show, people would say, oh, is, the, is, this, is this song on the record? Is that such and such song on the record? No, no, I'm afraid not. No, I'm afraid not, little boy. Yeah, there was a lot of that. And I got sick of giving money back, Jeff, so um, um, I went in the studio two afternoons last summer and cut this record live at Loud Mouse Studios, and it's uh, 15 cover tunes that I do, awesome. a kind of obscure cover tunes. So it, this is a real representation of, of the trio. This is how we sound live. It's recorded live, and uh, the, really happy with it. The best way up. to sound. Like, I mean, that's what you guys are. We are. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of that. The fact, you know, we, we went and cut this. And most of these, are, a lot of these are first and second takes, and... You know, that's how we sounded that day anyway. I mean, yeah. it's, it's different all the time, which is great for us, keeps it interesting for us and for the audiences. And Steve and Dennis, they're all right musicians, so I think they can handle it, right? Th they're okay. They're all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can pretty much handle anything you throw at them. Yeah, they're amazing, amazing players, yeah. And how has it changed over the years? I mean, you used to play bass, too. That's how people know you, the bass man. And now you play guitar. What, what made you kind of switch up instruments like that? I think when I started writing more and... Uh, uh, yeah, I started woodshedding playing guitar and it's just, you know, when you're sitting around the house playing bass just doesn't really cut, you only work out so many bass lines and and I, I really wanted to work on my guitar playing so I started learning some, you know, jazz standards and things like that and, that, and then that really informed my writing, uh, playing, learning all these great chords and changes, that really informed the writing on my uh, Under the Big Big Sky album. 
And then when I started playing with Steve uh, Briggs, that really informed my guitar playing. He's just the greatest guitar player, and you know, it's like being on the road with my guitar teacher, which is just fantastic. You know, so, and, and and we play all the time. It's fantastic. We have to play a ton, but also a guitar just lent itself more to me be doing my solo thing. And um, to me, I you know, I, I kind of strive to be. I want to be a really great rhythm guitar player. I mean, I, it's, to me, it's the most important in all the music that we love. I think uh, it's the most important instrument in the band. Really, it's yeah. the center of all that music. That's funny because I read an article lately that the bass is the most important <laughs> part of a band, but, right? Obviously, but, <laughs> obviously written by a bass player. Yeah. But playing rhythm guitar. I used to feel that way, Jeff. <laughs> playing rhythm guitar um, and then uh, obviously being a bass player, or I don't know, maybe that happened by accident that you became a bass player too. Kind of, they, the band needed a bass player when I was a, when I was a kid. Kind of. Well, well, we don't have a bass player. That's kind of is kind of how it happened, uh, but. I think um, being a bass has really helped my rhythm guitar playing, no, no question about it. Yeah. And you know, being a rhythm guitar, I, I love playing rhythm guitar. I get to drive this big groove machine, and as you mentioned about Dennis and Steve, these guys are just great players. I mean, these yeah. guys can solo you know, around the clock. It's always interesting, always fantastic, but uh, the first thing we go for is groove, first and foremost. Timing and groove, and uh, so I get to drive that big groove machine. That's really exciting for me. It's great. I mean, we play dances with this trio. And people are always surprised at how big the sound is. And well, you know, you've seen it. And with, with Dennis, uh, again, I think pretty much every show we do, I'll, I'll see people come in and they see an accordion. And they go, oh, man, there's, man, there's an, these guys have an accordion. Yeah, then they're thinking, you know, something else entirely. And then by the second song, I can see them. They're just, their jaws are kind of on the floor. I mean, De Dennis is a very unique player, an amazing uh, player, as you know. And he picks up the bottom end stuff, and it's so rhythmic. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a big full sound for a trio. And what's it like coming from basically, Perry Oyster became a corporation almost, right? It became big business and you were one vote. You were, yeah. Oyster Music Inc. <laughs> well, there you go. But, and you, got, you were one vote in this big machine and everything. And now you're an independent artist. How do you like it being an independent artist? Do you feel like you have more freedom and control? And I mean, you're, you're, you're really putting yourself out there too, right? It's all up to you now. Do you like that? Do you like living on the edge? Uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently I do. Um, it's it's yeah, it's wacky. Like Steve says, well, my idea of a living on the edge is just just trying to make the rent every month, and it's uh, it's kind of true. I mean, it, it's a different world, you know. I mean, Oyster had its own thing. I mean, it was really I'm really proud of what what we accomplished with that group, really on our, on our on our own terms and. Uh, it really, for most of my life, obviously satisfied my, you know, my musical urges, you know, and uh, then I got these other urges, and <laughs> no, and uh, I, I just think now at this point in my life, I really, like I say, I want to be telling my story. I feel like I'm being probably more creative than I've, I've ever been, and uh, I do like playing these intimate venues, and uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's... The downside to that is that there's it's 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 a lot of work. I'm doing everything myself. I'm booking the thing. I'm basically managing myself, and I'm unmanageable, basically. And and I'm trying to manage myself. You have a lot of long conversations with yourself. <laughs> I truly I do. Yeah. No answers. Dressing dressing myself down. <laughs> so what? And when you talk about obscure covers and stuff, what is some of the things that people that haven't seen Russell DeCarl, if you haven't seen him, shame on you first of all, but. Um, what are some of the things that people can expect when they go see Russell DeCarl? Um, again, a, a lot. Of, I do a few things from the Oyster. I, I was concerned about that initially. I was I was concerned that people were just going to come out and expect me to be doing Oyster material, which I don't do. I do a few things that I wrote with Oyster, and I can tell the stories behind those songs. But I don't really feel it's fair to the rest of the band. And also, I played those songs for years and years. I mean, I have a whole lot of new material, so they can expect to hear a lot of new material and expect to hear me as as a singer, not a country singer. A lot of people. You know, kind of ghettoized themselves as a uh, country singer. Yeah, well, for me, I've just always been a singer. My mother said that I was the only person she knew that could sing with his mouth, with it, sing with his mouth full. So, sing while I was eating. So, I mean, I just love to sing everything, and I'm a product really of everything I grew up with. And I grew up at a time when the radio was far less formatted. Uh, I heard. So, I mean, I, th I think, I, well, Chum was the big radio station in Toronto when I was a kid, and of course the Chum chart came out every week, and I'm pretty sure on, on, on one week you would hear uh, you would hear the uh, Beatles, the Rolling Stones, you would hear the Love and Spoonful with auto harp solos on pop songs, you would hear Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, on and, uh, Buck Owens. Uh, they had it right. Gosh, yeah, it was fantastic, yeah, truly, you know, so I mean, I, I'm just a, and again, that all informs, you know, what I write and what, what I do now.
That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let you get this show on the road. We got a show to do. I got a show to watch, anyways. So, Russell DeCarl, everybody. Your mom's making he's got to, That's right. He's got to get into his, his Porter Wagner jackets and stuff. See you, folks. Senses.